before we even start, I'm going to say how many of you have seen this film on the big screen before today? Wow, quite a few of you. <laughs> Fabulous. It's not like I haven't had a chance. It's been around for a while. That's <laughs> true. It is working. Yes, <laughs> very true. Uh, John, such a pleasure to have you with us at the London Action Festival. And this is such a treat, right? 35 years of Toyota. And here we are with this with this full house of audience. I have to first kind of give you a huge congratulations on our moving target award. <laughs> and uh, on on Friday night, he he received this 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 wonderful award. And there were a couple of lovely statements that came in from Alec Baldwin, for example. He said, in his one acting lesson with me, he gave me when we were shooting for the hunt. Uh, for Red October, it still rings in my ears today as I was fiddling with everything and John said, can't you just stand there and do nothing? And you know what, John? You were right. I love that. <laughs> Care to comment? No, no. That's not what I want to do. <laughs> okay. And uh, Michael Tadros Sr., the producer of Die Hard with a Vengeance, and the Thomas Crown Affair said, you can't bullshit John, he's an unbullshitable director. <laughs> John McTiernan is a genius, he's brilliant, and one of the nicest human beings I've ever known in my life, and he's my friend. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, so John, let's start with, with asking about Predator, because this is the one time we had a movie, that's a popcorn movie, it's action, sci-fi, and a slasher horror movie as well. You managed to genre blend it so seamlessly. Was that in your thoughts when you when you started creating this? Uh, I don't know. I suppose so. It was probably in the script. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, the idea wasn't to. I was just trying to make a. <sighs> Um, I was trying to make a 14-year-old boy's movie, that's all. <laughs> What's this the sort of film you would have wanted to create as a 14-year-old boy? I mean, just what I did. I mean, that <laughs> style of movie, that's all. Um, it was um, filled with nonsense and um, looked heroic. <laughs> Fabulous. Now, I mean, you started your journey getting a, a great education in the arts at Juilliard, for example. Uh, was making cinema always in the cards for you? Were your family supportive of you going into the business? Uh, I don't know. I think I was too much of a <laughs> problem for my family. They gave up about what, <laughs> what I would go into. Um, My father was a lawyer, but he went blind in World War II. He lost his sight in World War II. Um, and so he pursued music as a, well, one of the few joys he had. Uh, and he used to sing opera. Um, so we would go for the summer with his arrangements and wind up getting a, you know, a vac vacation for his family while he sang at various opera houses through the through the summer. Uh, so I sort of grew up backstage um, in opera where you don't know what the words are. I mean, it doesn't matter what the words are. It's how a person sounds if he says them. Um, and then when I, when I went to grad school for film, the American Film Institute, um, you know, you, you see like three movies a day or something. And I just stopped reading um, the subtitles. Um, and just when it sort of never made any difference after all. I mean, if a movie, movie works, it works. It, and you can tell, you get the idea of what they're saying. It doesn't matter. I'm babbling here. I don't, I don't know if any of this is responsive to your question. <laughs> So uh, tell me about some of the early movies you saw as a child that might have inspired you to go on to make these greats. Um, I don't know, something I did with that. I, just, I didn't realize at the time. My mother was extremely bored. Um, 
when I was a little kid because you used to go to the movies every day. Um, and if there wasn't a babysitter or anything, so I went to the movies and there weren't any limits on what you could take a child to. Um, so I realized, I didn't realize it until I was like 30, until I was in grad school. I realized I'd seen it all, every movie in the 1960s. I'd seen all the grown up movies in the 1960s. Um, when I was a little kid, it wouldn't have been, but I, um, I realized that I'd seen, I'd, you know, when I was 30, as I said, I realized I'd seen all those movies, all sorts of movies that they started to show us uh, at AFI, at the High and the Mighty and all the, um, that whole generation of Hollywood films. Um, and I'd seen it when I was a little kid, when I was still in school. Wow. And, and when you started your, your journey into Hollywood, would you say, you know, what, what would you cite as the movies that you'd seen as a child that inspired you to, to, to get in there and start directing? Um, I don't know that, I mean, there were movies I liked. I don't know if they inspired me to, um, I don't know. Um, I, would, I thought I wanted to go into theater. Um, to be a theater director, but somewhere rather early, I discovered that theater directors are both gay and have a trust fund. And so <laughs> I realized I was completely ill equipped. <laughs> so, um, and, and filmmaking was sort of a mix of, of an aesthetic pursuit and engineering. It still is engineering. Um, and so, an engineer sort of mind, um, so it was always, you know, um, I never thought of the path of least resistance, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, you know, I, I read an interview with the Russo brothers, I've spoken to them recently, and in, in Financial Times, they cited you as a big inspiration for them to go into the action genre. And that genre of, of movies, in some ways, you kind of resur resurrected it, didn't you, on, on, on screen. How do you feel about being that inspiration for so many people? Couldn't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair I'm enough. Basically, you know, it's lovely to say I, that, no. The one th what I did was I had a, a, an actual film education. Um, so I knew what Europeans were doing and had been doing for the previous 15 years. And most of the guys making action movies, were, um, they didn't have a film education. No. They didn't know what other people were doing. I mean, they were still doing nasty movie and close up and stuff. Um, but, so I just took the techniques of, you know, of Fellini and Berlucci and, and, and those people, stuff they've been doing for 20 years in Europe, and just applied it to silly movies like this. Wow, wow, that, that's, that, that is amazing. Now, let's, let's jump to Pente, because everyone wants to hear about it. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger wasn't your first choice. Jean-Claude Van Damme was, is that correct? Uh, no, 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 no. Um, Let's clarify that then. Wow. No, that story is uh, apparently gotten twisted somewhere. Um, it was a goofy business of some agents who had just hired this mm, Belgian, I guess, um, Jean Claude Van Damme, you know. And uh, they, heard, they heard that we had this movie where it was Arnold against the monster. And so they. Um, they pressed the studio for, well, why can't our guy play the monster? And there wasn't anybody at the studio who had the courage to say, the monster is a seven foot rubber suit. You really want to put your new movie star in a seven foot rubber suit? And so, you know, everyone involved was just filled with courage and no one said one word to poor Jean-Claude. And they sent him all the way down to Mexico for airplane lifts. And someone told him that 
Favorite memory of Warwick Park? Of, of Arnold, working with Arnold on set. Oh, I don't suppose all that. I don't know. Um, I mean, in general, um, I had campaigned that we try to go do stuff for him. I really wanted to go to the jungle and do, you know, and I wanted to take a camera and actually, but the first day, First thing we shot, um, and, and it was just some stuff that I'm supposed to supposedly learn from a monster or something. And and I just took this miserable pathway up through some jungle, that, and it had mud and this. Um, and we got out there with a handheld camera. And we climbed through the mud with them, and had they were climbing through the mud, and there was all this stuff and yelling, and and it was simple and it was real and it was make believe because we were actually doing it. We we're actually climbing up this terrible, slippery hillside in the mud, and we we're all getting miserable. And he loved it. He loved it because it was real. It wasn't acting. It wasn't you know bullshit in the studio. Um, and he always loved days where we get to do anything real. Um, the more real it was, you know, having to go swim in a giant river in mud. Any of those days, he loved them. Um, and, and it was fine for me because, you know, I was just trying to make the thing look real. So if I could get moved to Arnold to actually go swim in this river, I'm uh, fine. You know, I'll have a cameraman with a little camera right in front of him on a rubber boat. Um, and we did all that sort of stuff, and he loved it. And because he loved it, we did that, because we, we were able to. Um, you know, there are a lot of other stars who hmm, don't really want to get too far from the trailer and don't want to leave the, stick, the studio. Or, um, and they're mostly about going to dinner. Uh, and Arnold was in the well, legend, <laughs> a legend indeed. And of course, with the ecosystem of the Predator, he kind of lands in Guatemala, but this is set in Mexico, sweltering heat, and like you said, you wanted to make it real, and we could feel that when we watched the film on screen. Um, any, any kind of memories about that, and about how you created that kind of humanoid Predator and, and showed him to us in such, a, in such a way that we hadn't seen before? It was very new to us. Uh, well, there was a man named Stan Winston who was his assistant. His assistant was a, he's a wonderful at it. And he built a wonderful monster with all the crazy stuff. And actually, every place the monster went, there were like eight kids with airplane controllers who were controlling his face. Um, oh, yeah, it was a big deal. And I kept him. It'll be crazy. Because I tr kept trying to, and I actually ultimately got two shots out of it. I kept trying to be able to see the monster act like he was a really, you know, strong, athletic, um, seven and a half foot tall thing, right? Um, so we actually put a suit on a monkey. Had the monkey go through the trees. The monkey hated the suit. <laughs> the monkey hated the suit. And uh, that didn't work. <laughs> and then I, I worked for a long time on this giant 
sponging way, a way to make the man, I mean, the man weigh 250 pounds, the suit weighed another 150 pounds. He could barely walk, you know? Um, so I, I wanted this, I wanted a device that would take 200, 250 pounds off. Um, so that he could use his own muscles to move. Um, and we did get a few shots out of it, but, and it was made out of bungee cords, right? Now, the amount of stress from bungee cord, like I thought I could get, just use a rope and put a barrel with rocks in it on the other side, but that moves too slowly. It can't, you know, the man tries to go up and it takes an, a two feet before the rocks go down and it just doesn't work. Uh, so I tried bungee cords. But the problem with bungee cords is it, um, the amount of pull from it keeps changing depending on how much you, right, okay, so uh, let's see. He takes a step up and the bungee cord shrinks by a foot and suddenly it isn't supported at all. He takes a step down and in the bungee cord stretches and now it's pulling 400 pounds up and he even can't, can't make the step down. So I had to figure out, okay, so then the bungee cord that's holding him has to be at least 100 feet long. Okay, so now I have to have a crane, which is what I did, I got a crane. Um, and I had these long bungee cords that would come down to him so that within a range of about three feet, the amount of pull on him was always the same and he could get used to it. And then a couple of shots still would survive of, of him stepping from one thing to another. Um, I'm sorry, how did I get into that? Oh no, <laughs> I'm, I'm just loving this because this is John the engineer talking. You engineered those scenes, wow. Something Movie makers have always been engineers. And no, I mean it, they always have. Um, you know, starting with, what's his name, who worked in Lyon, who had the, you know, terrified the audience by having a train appear to come out of the screen. Um, movie makers have always been engineers. Kubrick was the father of an engineer. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, and let's just remember back to the heat of Mexico and having to survive that for the whole shoot. Because how long did the shoot take? Oh, I don't know, 70 days or so. And in that terrifying heat, how did you cope? Well, I don't know. It wasn't terrifying. Okay. As, as long as we were, as long as we were in the jungle, it was fine. Um, I don't know. Uh, just that was it. just, we just all got used to it. We just said, look, this is where we are. And, and actually it helped. Um, it helped for, for the poor guy in the suit. Okay. That was a different deal. Okay. We got uh, these things that they made for race car drivers, which is the best that race car drivers get over here. And it was a vest that would circulate cold water around his back inside the suit to keep him cool. But the rest of us, we got, you know, it was part of the deal. It was part of, it made it more real for the actors. It made everything better, actually. <laughs> Fabulous. I will be coming to the audience. We have some roving mics here. But uh, before that, I just wanted to ask you, how much footage did you shoot for this film? And was it quite hard to edit, edit it down? And is there a director's cut? Um. I, we didn't turn to it after my cut, I guess we can answer that. Um, so we use another one. Um, no, there isn't that much. See, part of what I did is, um, again, using then current European techniques, I didn't just shoot master, medium, and close up. You know, put several cameras on the thing, let it all run, blah, 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 and then have an editor see if he can make up a story of this. Um, I, 
you know, it seemed to me that it wasn't that it just seemed to me. Europeans were always already making movies where every cut is planned, every shot is planned. This shot follows that shot, just as this note follows that note in music. You don't just throw a bunch of notes into a box and paste them together to come up with a movie score. You don't just throw a bunch of different shots in a bin and paste them together to come up with a movie. Um, um, shots are specific. They start in a particular way. They have a different particular speed. They have a key, if you will, just as music has a key. And there are, you know, there are eight tones that are in that key. And you hit one of the other notes on the piano and it's off. It sounds and sound right. Um, it's the same thing in the film. Um, so a shot doesn't just go in there. It goes after this shot and before that shot. And we should know within a reasonable range where this shot's going, which frame it's going to start on, um, and, and how far it's going to go, and then what you're going to. Um, so I would shoot, in effect, I was sort of, in a way, I wasn't editing the camera, but I would shoot the shots that I wanted to use. I didn't just put up a bunch of cameras on whatever was going on. Um, so actually, um, I've always shot very little. I mean, I think the normal range runs somewhere between 10 and 20 on the amount of footage then um, that people would shoot would be between 10 and 20 times um, the length of the movie. And I don't know. This one's like six times, five or six times. Wow, well, very efficient. No, it's just, it's just, um, I, I don't know. Most DC directors do the same thing now. And I was only do it, doing it, I was doing it early in the United States, but it, but it wasn't early for Europeans. Europeans had already figured out how to do it. A lot of Italians and Frenchmen had already figured out how to do it. Wonderful, wonderful. Now we are very lucky because we have an extended Q and A today, which means that if you have some burning questions, you can ask them now. All I ask of you is to not give comments and just give us an actual question, and keep them to one question per person, and also uh, just to say, yeah, ask away. <laughs> can we go for gentleman in the green top? Oh, very well aligned. Hello, uh, so my question is, uh, Shane Black is involved in the movie and uh, it's kind of a weird choice as an actor because he's a fantastic writer. So there are rumors around that says that he was probably helping with the script. So I wonder whether you remember being a specific choice to bring. No, that was exactly what it was about. Um, uh, I tried, he had just written Lethal Weapon for Joel Silver and I loved the screenplay. And I tried to get him to rewrite this screenplay, uh, and he wouldn't do it. So what I did do is, is I hired him as an actor, <laughs> <laughs> just to have him around. Genius. Just come up with ideas, and he came up with all all that. He came up with his own character, with his own dialogue, all those hideous, stupid jokes, <laughs> <laughs> all that stuff was wonderful. Uh, and yes, that was exactly why he was. He was there uh, because he was smart and interesting and funny, and we figured we'd get ideas out of him. Next question. Uh, let's go for gentleman in the front. Hello, Jeff. Nice to meet you. Um, this is the one of the classic films you made, the action, really good film, um, let's, let's get to the chopper quickly. And uh, I just want to say to you quickly, um, it's, it's not related, I guess it still relates to it. The Father of October, Sean Connery, how, do you, how was it like working with him? 
and also how to be preparing for the other even actors you work with, including Arnold. Oh, I don't know. Every every actor is different. Um, part of the director's job is to figure out what they act, the actor is like and figure out how to serve them. Um, Sean used to scare people because he was tough old guy. Um, but, but he, he was frankly just like, <laughs> so I had no difficulty with it. Um, he was just like, my grandpa was just about as scary. Um, so, I don't know. The first few days he worked, everybody was, was afraid of him um, and worried and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I think the second night, uh, at the end of the second day of shooting, on his way home, um, as he went, walked toward his car, he said, Good night, boy. And I knew I was in by then, you know. <laughs> that in his parlance and in the parlance of my family, too. Um, you know, that was an endearment. Um, and, um, and we always did fine. Uh, Arnold, as I said, um, Arnold loves to do physical things. Just, um, and loves to compete. And I don't know, Arnold, Arnold is a sponge for information. He is, he is really an extraordinary man. Genuinely and extraordinarily um, in any field. Um, um, I, I think he should be running for president in the States right now <laughs> to save our asses from these crazy people. Um, <laughs> that's not funny. I'm sorry. We're living in 1932, guys. The major nation in our culture is in the middle of a fascist revolution, and that is not just crying wolf, that's what's happening. We need people to help save the whole fucking world to be terrified. They will lead us into a war with China inevitably. I'll be dead already, but an awful lot of you are gonna live through it, and you should worry about it like fucking us. All right, next question. Uh, can we go for oh, oh boy, I just shut the whole audience up. <laughs> uh, you want some more politics? Great, okay. And then we can go home right now. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering about the location challenges uh, while shooting the movie and if you stumbled upon any locations that you saw on the on the in the jungle and you were like, okay, we're shooting here and it wasn't planned. Well, no, you don't say you just don't do that. You know. We're shooting here and it's not planned. Um, no, you make them plan it. Uh, but you you uh, you, you know, it's sort of like being a military officer. You got the logistics to deal with, and you just you, know, you better deal with it. Every time. Um, in Mexico, the way we would work at a place is, um, you know, once we decide, okay, we're going to shoot this day at this place. The first thing we do is we get a squad of local farmers, peons, um, and they would go in and get the poisonous snake out. For real, I'm not kidding. Um, um, and then we would also, we found that, uh, you know, a path in the jungle, if you take a movie company into it, they all go right to the path, and then you have a pile of junk and stuff. So if you're going to work in a location, the place where you're going to shoot, you have to keep everything out of, so that means you have to build other paths leading into it. You have to engineer all the stuff you plan. Um, um, other times, you know, you build machinery that goes, like when I did um, Jason Boy, it was all about, I put something I wanted to do a lot, was, you know, get a camera, 
work as a horse. They win a horse. So I built machines. Um, I built a three-wheeled motorcycle, three wheels in line. Um, and two of them were powered in the back and had great big tractor tires on it, but I didn't have you know, you got a strong motorcycle rider who could go in between trees and you would carry a man with a camera on your shoulder. Um, you know, you build the machines that go with the, that go with wearing different horses. Um, I've always wanted to go, I've always wanted to do movies in different places, and, and I've always wanted, I mean, again, with the Boys Adventure stuff, I, a lot of the things I've done have been outside I like it better than doing movies about things in an office. Um, um, and so I try to go to different places. Um, and each place, there would be different um, uh, challenges, but that's just, like I said, it's engineering. You know, you figure out how to make this work. How are you going to get 100 people to get a movie out of this particular area? in a certain number of production days. Does that answer your question? Yeah, great. Uh, fabulous, thank you. The importance of a, a good recce, obviously. Uh, we have a, a lady here who has a mask on. Can you? Uh, it's been, well, it's the 35th anniversary of Predator, and John has advanced tremendously with technology within the last 35 years. Is there a certain scene in this film you would love to uh, have film with the technology we have today? <laughs> no, um, you know, the cameras are lighter. Um, yeah, sure. Somebody would probably say, why don't we all do it on a stage with an LED screen behind? There's a difference. There's just a difference. Um, and somebody actually, I think they're English, but just they did some research about the difference between a movie seen by a whole group of people in a theater and a movie seen by somebody on a big screen, you know, by themselves. Um, and there's an enormous amount of pheromones and sounds and all sorts of things and experience, literally. The human beings, you know, a large group of human beings experiencing the same thing is completely different. And um, now, actually, I think it was Aristotle who talked about that. They talk about the agora and the, and the exchange of information and that sort of stuff. So it's like the more things that change, the more they stay the same. I wouldn't use, I wouldn't shoot much of Predator in a particularly different way with the, with the technologists or technologists, that's all. Um, um, unfortunately, there, there's this thing that happens that uh, deceives people when a new technology comes along. Um, and it usually, if it's film, it drives things backwards for a few years. Like the first few years of talkie movies were nowhere near as good as the last few years of silent movies in terms of movies. Because they were, you know, they thought the sound was doing everything for them. Um, you know, and there are a lot of people who in recent years thought you could make the whole movie in a computer and, um, and it would be fantastic. And some of them are All of them are just tools. And, if you, and they're wonderful or not, whatever. But tools are not company. Okay? It's, and, and as long as you don't get confused about that, uh, the things are fine. Good answer. I'd like to go to the back, please. Can we go to the back side? There's a gentleman with his hand up, I believe. Sorry guys, I can barely see you at the back there, but... Uh. Hi there, um, I just wanted to know whether you were happy with it when you finished it, and how many times you've watched it since, and you picked out all of the things that went wrong, or did you 
take a break. Um, I, yeah, I usually never look at my own movies, so I, I can't. But years afterwards, because it always seems just stuff I fucked up. Um, <laughs> And you know, I'm still beating myself up over how bad this movie is. Uh, and then there's eventually the gaggle, which is about 20 years ago or something. Like that. Um, I don't know. I I have seen them since they came out, but not not recently. Uh, what did I do? I have seen. I saw Die Hard for the first time last week. The first time in years and years. Um, and I saw The Thief Warrior for the first time in the year 20. Um, and was happy. Um, uh, Die Hard had, had a lot of ambition. Uh, and I see him as a censor. Uh, <coughs> it was kind of, um, Die Hard, had a sense of courage in it, of mostly young men, but it was a group of young men who were really swimming for their fences, and I like that. It shows up. Um, 13th Warrior, my reaction was uh, somewhere about halfway through, two thirds of the way through, I said, wow, what a grand adventure. Um, and that, that, that basic sense of Okay, we're going to take an urban guy from a completely different culture, and you're going to go out on one of the primordial battles of this. Uh, <coughs> and I was happy that I had achieved at least some of that fear um, that was in there. Um, I can't tell you about this one necessarily. Um, I don't really remember the last time I saw this. I'm sorry, I'm going in circles. <laughs> no problem. Uh, there is somebody with a hand up with a white t-shirt right at the back, last row. Sorry to make you run up the stairs. Who has a burning question, I can tell from here. Uh, thanks, Mr. McBean, for, um, for booking the festival. It's, it's been fantastic. Can I just ask, um, when you made this, did you have any concept about the Predator IP becoming a franchise, or have you at any point being asked to actually return to it. Thank you. Um, no. Um, this was before the studios were, were entirely controlled by us. Um, uh, overseers of the money. Um, so it was before, you know, they would turn out five and six of the same movie over and over. Um, um, so we hadn't really, you know, if 